Let me see. Can I get a verbal? Is that sharing? Yeah. Okay. Well, that's exciting. Um, although I will say, so I'm just looking at my screen. I wish I could see your faces so that you could, you know, make it a little more human and reactions and stuff. But um, I'm super excited um, for this red square. And Subu, I'm setting a timer because I know we talked about time. I'll try not to go over. This is a really broad, um, it, like the more I've worked on this, the, the bigger it's gotten. And so I'm, it'll be very high level. Um, I think we may only get to the theoretical side of building a socialist platform and less to the practice side during the presentation. And I think the practice side is where I think we can look at a lot more examples that apply specifically to the Texas ledge. And so I know that a lot of people want to talk about that. So let's not, um, so don't take my presentation as meaning we're not going to talk about that. Um, we can definitely cover that in the discussion period. But um, yeah, essentially what, I, what I'd like to look at is, you know, why do we, why do we think about platforms and talk about platforms? Where do platforms come from? And for me, um, I looked at it from a theoretical lens and then from a lens of looking at how they're utilized in socialist organizations and left liberal organizations. And from the theoretical side, um, Vivek Chibber um, authored a pamphlet um, called The ABCs of Capitalism. I think it may have been published by either Verso or Jacobin, um, but great pamphlet um, and um, a good introduction to capitalism. So I'm using that kind of as my primer and my first principles approach to what a platform would look like. Um, I'm, I initially put this slide in in order to have, to have some warm up conversation, but for time purposes, I think we can leave most of these questions about, you know, how detailed should a platform be? What do people think of when they think of a, a party's platform? You know, what's the purpose? Who's the audience? That sort of thing. Um, we can get into those details, I think, during the discussion. Um, for now, I would, um, you know, I was thinking about it and thinking, you know, what does a platform, what is it for me? And my the thought that comes to my head is it's a way to put theory into practice. It's a way to take um, it's a set of issues basically that implement a set of principles. And so I think a lot of those principles come from the theory of how capitalism works and how socialists look at capitalism. And so the lessons I take from the ABCs of capitalism are basically three observations pulled from the three pamphlets. And the first one is that big surprise, you know, shocker to all of us, I'm sure capitalism is bad. Um, but there's a specific way in which it's bad, which I think can inform how we approach issues um, and how we build a platform. Second observation is that capitalists control the state and the political process, which has implications for us. And the third observation is that the solution to these things is class struggle, um, but that and that can also affect what issues we prioritize. So the first observation is that capitalism is bad and the high, you know, the, this is going to be a very, very truncated story of how capitalism works, but essentially um, it's a story of classes and commodification that previously people had produced for themselves and were able to access the basic necessities of life on our own. Um, but private control and ownership over the productive assets in society, that is over the means of production, um, did two things. One, it, it makes working for a wage for someone else, wage labor that is, um, the dominant form of labor in society, and it makes nearly all production uh, geared towards selling on the market. And so these are interrelated, and when people lost the ability to produce for themselves, they had to buy everything from the market, but of course to get money for those things, you have to end up working for a wage. And so that capitalist production gives us, you know, a class division in society between the owning classes and the working classes, and it commodifies and puts all, you know, the basic necessities of life. Did we lose Marcus? Yeah, he's frozen for me. Activism is kind of like, where do, where do we focus? And I guess if I were to summarize pamphlet one of the ABCs of capitalism, I would, I would this, is, this is the way I was trying to put it in as concise language or as concise uh, heuristic as possible. 
And that is this, this view that injustices exist in the world, but they're not random injustices and they're not, a bit, they're not just there because people are randomly mean to each other or something like that. They're there because there are power differentials and certain people have more power to oppress and exploit other groups of people. But then of course you have to ask the question, where does that power come from? And for Chibber and for socialists, that power comes from primarily a difference in resources that a certain class of people has more resources. We would say the owning class, you know, the capitalist class has a, a stranglehold on most of the resources uh, in society. And the, most people have very little access to those resources and the wealth of the society. And then where do, where does that division come from? Well, that's, that comes from the class division. And so the other thing that I'd like to point out that I think is really important when we look at a platform is that we emphasize here the working class, not because we think that the working class is more oppressed or like the most oppressed group or no one else suffers more or, or anything like that. So it's not a moral judgment. It's about working classes position strategically located in production next to, you know, within production gives it the strength to kind of break through that stranglehold that the capitalist class has. So what does that give us? So I derive from that kind of story, a few criteria. So the first is that the issues we should highlight are issues that illustrate how class society and commodification, that is capitalism, hurts the working class and how basically how we're dominated. And so these are issues which are good to address on their own, but um, like the examples I give are minimum wage here, paid sick leave, safety regulations, political corruption. I mean, sick leave, I think paid sick leave, especially because we had that fight here in Austin, I think really illustrated it for me. The, I mean, essentially what you've got is you've got working class people who depend on this very vital thing, literally this vital thing in their lives. It, they depend on people giving it to them whose interests are in direct, you know, directly opposed to theirs. Um, and there's just this visceral reaction, and we saw it, you know, during testimony and paid sick leave. And I think those kinds of these kinds of issues, you know, in a platform can really illustrate how it's not just randomness, it's not just mean people or something causing problems, but it is, um, you know, it's the nature of class society that does that kind of thing. And then a the second criteria, given our story of capitalism, is to approach to, to address issues that actually do reduce the class structure's imbalance in power and resources and how it, um, and how it produces that. I think we, one of the things that we can emphasize when we think about this is the notion of bargaining power. That is, how much bargaining power, negotiating power does the working class have now and how can we improve that in relation to their fight, our fight against the capitalist class. And so these kinds of issues are things that would um, help shift power and shift the, the balance of class forces, things like union organizing, workplace democracy, um, taxing the rich for social goods and redistributing um, um, money and power downwards, decommodifying life's necessities. In other words, taking these things that used to be, you know, that have now been placed on the market, making them public goods so that everyone has access. That gives workers bargaining power because they know they don't rely on their jobs for them. Um, and that can be very powerful too. So a second observation from the ABCs of capital is that capitalists control the state and they control it at, at three levels, the personal level, the institutional level and the structural level. And so I'll review these and we'll have some criteria for each one. At the personal level, let me pull up my notes here. At the personal level, we see that politicians share kind of a, a, the people in government are nearly all wealthy. You know, they share a class background with each other. They're overwhelmingly, you know, corporate managers, they're the, you know, corporate lawyers, investment bankers, almost all millionaires. And so this reflects their worldview. You know, we know that in polls. Um, there was the revolving door issue of politicians using their position to get jobs afterwards. And then of course, they have shared social networks. They go to the same schools and country clubs and all that kind of stuff, and they don't want to be kicked out. So for socialists, this probably isn't going to be our main focus, but it's there. 
And so issues like having a living wage for representatives, which is something that we do not have in the Texas state ledge, um, would be something that could be a mechanism for helping working class people, you know, become, you know, take take positions within the state, within within our, our governmental bodies. Um, I also threw in there class-based quotas for elected bodies. It was just something off the top of my head. It's a little more aspirational, but, you know, in other parts of the world, they do it for things like gender balance. And so, you know, let's be aspirational. Um, the second way that capitalists exert control over the state is uh, they do it at an institutional level. And this is usually what people think, think of, I think, more commonly. And the institutions here I'm thinking of are the lobbying process where organized groups pressure elected officials. Theoretically, that could be an avenue for working class to exert control. But of course, in reality, you know, Chibber cites that the ratio of business spending on lobbying to labor spending is 56 to one. So 56 times, business spends 56 times the amount of money on lobbying that labor does. Um, and, and of course they get that money from their position in the economy. Um, and then, you know, privately financed elections. And, you know, we think of like, you know, Citizens United and things like that. Um, and there are some exceptions like the Bernie campaign, but overwhelmingly the wealthy do fund elections here. Um, you know, 158 families accounted for half of all the early money raised in, 20, in the 2016 cycle. And essentially what you get is candidates then just make their priorities acceptable to the rich and they cater to elite opinion. You get a capital veto. So, you know, campaign financing, citizen redistricting, which is, you know, redistricting is ongoing in Texas right now, voting rights, lobbying reform, ballot access laws, this kind of thing, I think, can um, be helpful to approach that issue. And finally, the, for this observation about the state, um, we have to look at how to reduce capitalist structure con structural control over the state. And this is just one more step um, further deeply embedded into the structure of how capitalism works. And I guess the, you know, I had to come up with another one of these like simplifications due to, you know, time constraints, but essentially the way the story is, is that the state, you know, is theoretically an avenue of democratic public control. The, the capitalist economy, of course, is not. By definition, it is private, privately owned, and we have private investment there. So the budget for the state, for our government, um, is not, the state doesn't own the economy, so that, that has to come from the private sphere. It has to come, especially with a growing population, from economic growth. And essentially, the state has to tax, they have to take a portion of the economic value created in the private sphere to use for government programs. That can only happen if there's economic growth, essentially. And the decisions about where economic growth, if it happens, come from business, uh, you know, private interests deciding whether they're going to invest it or not. And that relates to whether they have, there's, they have, you know, confidence, business confidence, which essentially is, you know, are they, you know, do they have confidence that they're going to be able to make money and, be, and profit from it? Or are they going to slow things down? And essentially another, you know, another way they can put a veto over any sort of populist control. And we started to see this, you know, as Bernie started to gain momentum, get further along in the process, the primary process, you know, started to see stories about like stock market could tank and that sort of thing. So issues related to this, I mean, this is a tough one to crack. Could we could do a whole red square just on this slide, but, um, public employment, you know, greater governmental spending, repealing the balanced budget amendment um, so that we can meet, meet people's needs, maybe having an income tax to replace the sales tax so, you know, government revenues aren't based solely and so sensitive to consumption, that sort of thing. Um, and if anybody wants to talk about modern monetary theory, we'll save that for the parking lot because that's a whole nother issue. Okay, and then, um, Last, pack, last pamphlet for ABCs of Capitalism and last observation is that class struggle is the solution. And, um, you know, I think this one's intuitive to a lot of us as, who are in or associated, you know, or, or looking at DSA, which is that we understand that problems are structural. And so we understand that solutions can't be individual, that we have to approach them collectively. And yet it's this painful irony that collective action is uniquely difficult for workers, um, but uniquely easier for the capitalist class. 
Workers have less power since bosses can hire and fire, you know, to organize. Workers have less money. They have less time. Even finding space can be difficult. Um, and then you've also got this problem of, of a collective action problem, which is essentially, you know, like a free rider problem. How do you overcome this situation when it can be in an individual's best interest personally to, you know, opt out of collective action? Oh, there's my alarm. There's my alarm. Don't worry, Subu. Don't worry. I'm aware of it. Um, and so for Chibber, you know, he, he says that the answer to this conundrum is solidarity. And solidarity is essentially the bonds of mutual obligation and respect that are developed especially well in democratic unions and organizations that allow you to overcome these collective action problems um, in order to, to gain power. And essentially it's saying, you know, an injury to one is an injury to all. And so I think there are two criteria that flow from this. First is obviously issues enabling collective labor action. So, you know, ding, 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 pro act here, ending the right to work, increasing union organizing protections, making strikes, you know, all strikes legal, um, allowing, I'm a state worker, you know, I work for the state, allowing collective bargaining and public sector um, um, to engage in the, collective bargaining process and get contracts and stuff. Um, all that sort of stuff is obviously necessary. Um, and as Sue was talking about in the introduction, I think institutionalizing that through a labor party is important. And then also issues facilitating working class struggle and solidarity. And this isn't the only way to look at these issues, of course, but I think it's you know really helpful to, to think about uh, when we think of solidarity, we're saying that you know, we're all in this together. And so if something affects one group more than another, we care about it. So issues of racial justice, criminal justice, immigration accessibility, LGBTQ protections, um, or other fights over public control of resources like, you know, I don't know, utilities or anything that affects a large swath of the population, um, especially much for the working class uh, and the poor um, can be issues where we throw down on. So that's the theory. That's a lot, I know, we, we you know, I've done, the three parts um, for the ABCs of socialism on its own as a three-part um, socialist night school, which we should do again. It's, it's a it's a great it's a great read, and you can have great discussion on each of those aspects. Um, this is the practice part. I think we should save a lot of this for discussion. I think we can get a lot about it. But basically, I went through and I looked at a bunch of different organizations and to pull out how they wrote their platforms and what they looked like. And so I looked at the Rhode Island Political Cooperative, which was a statewide and, you know, um, cooperative, which grouped together a bunch of political functions like fundraising and lit and door knocking and all that kind of stuff in order to help um, a political insurgency in Rhode Island. New York DSA, super extensive platform. Um, Every Texan is a, a liberal NGO here in Austin, but I included it because they're specific, they're, Texas specific and they're focused on the legislature during session. Heidi for Congress, obviously that's why I'm wearing my shirt. Um, great platform. Bernie 2020, of course, great platform. Um, People's Action, not a socialist organization. I'd call, I, you know, I'd say that they're left liberal, um, but also a good platform. And then I, we don't have to look at it now, but it's in the, the presentation if anybody wants to, but um, put them all on a little table to see like what different things and issues and geographies they were focusing on. I will say before we end and open it up for discussion that um, DSA has just released, as Dave talked about during the meeting last night, released its draft national platform. These are the 11, I believe, um, planks in it. And they have short-term, medium-term, and long-term goals for all of them, you know, specific issues that they're, that they're tackling. And so, you know, this is something to be aware of and, you know, maybe something we could probably deserves its own red square and its own um, discussion. And then, um, so thanks everybody. And I'll leave it with some discussion questions about, I'd love to hear what people thought about platforms. I'd love to hear what people think, especially about how they might apply in Texas with the Texas legislature going on and session going on and kind of issues that we wanna approach there. Um, and, you know, both in Texas and DSA context. So I'll leave it there.